Welcome to Proclaiming Justice, a podcast from PJTN that focuses the light of truth on vital issues in today's headlines that impact every American. I'm your host, Laurie Cardoza Moore, founder and president of Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, and I'm here to educate, motivate, and activate you to action. I want to arm you with the truth and the facts you'll need to fight and preserve our constitutional republic and uphold the Judeo-Christian values our nation was founded upon. The biblical prophets speak of a greater exodus, a second exodus to occur in the last days when God regathers the nations of Israel and Judah. God's people who have been scattered throughout the nations of the world will be set free from their spiritual, economic, and political enslavement in the nations. Many believe that this unfulfilled prophecy will soon come to pass. Hello, and thank you for joining me today on Focus on Israel. On our program today, we continue to explore one of the most important biblical prophecies ever given, the prophecy of the second exodus. Now, if you haven't viewed part one of this teaching, then I highly suggest you do. The importance of this information cannot be overemphasized. Please go to our website to find out how you can watch the second exodus part one online or order a DVD copy to view at home. In our previous episode, we discussed the historical and biblical connections that make up the basis of the prophecy. The first exodus occurred as Moses led the Hebrew people out of Egypt and to Canaan. Multiple scriptures also tell of a second exodus. They speak of the greatness and immensity of it as the houses of Israel return to the promised land. But this coming exodus will not be easy and not without tribulation and punishment. Jeremiah talks of this first as Jacob's trouble, and again, cites the coming judgment for sin. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goes forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not return until he has done it, and until he has performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will consider it. These verses actually repeat Jeremiah 23, verses 19 through 20, almost word for word. This repetition is significant because Jeremiah 23 is a warning against false prophets. In particular, it is about men claiming to speak for God, who tell the people whose lives deny God that the Lord has said, you shall have peace. These prophets say to the people who were walking according to the dictates of their own hearts, no evil will come upon you. In essence, they deny God's justice and the fact that sin has consequences. God always desires peace, but if the sinning party is unwilling to face reality and repent, then his response will be a painful one. There will be peace with God only when the sinner is broken and submits to God. Yet the false prophets insinuate that God does not care and that it does not matter how one lives. Nevertheless, these verses show that God destroys those who promote the idea that sin does not have consequences, who say God's justice is of little concern. These ideas keep getting Israel indeed all of mankind, into trouble. The symbol of the whirlwind, then, represents God's fury and anger. Just as no man can control or divert a tornado or hurricane, so God's anger at the sin of the wicked cannot be resisted. It will continue until he has performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days, which we are in, God says, we will consider it, meaning that Israel and Judah have not yet learned this lesson. However, when that chastening is over, Israel and Judah will be restored to the land. And more importantly, they will be reconciled to God and able to live in peace. At the same time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel and they shall be my people. 
Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness, Israel, when I went to give him rest. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. After God performs the intents of his heart, as it says at the end of the previous chapter, and his wrath has consumed those he will consume, then peace in the relationship between Israel and God becomes possible because of all of those who declared war on God through their conduct are dead. God does not believe in peace at any price. He works toward repentance. But if there is no repentance, the only solution is to destroy those in rebellion against him. Yes, after the destruction, he promises once again to be the God of all of Israel and Israel again be his people. For thus says the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob and shout among the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the ends of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and the one who labors with child. Together a great throng shall return there. They shall come with weeping, and with supplications I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles afar off. And say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him, as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. By the time these verses are fulfilled, something critical has happened. We do not know exactly how or when, but this passage hints that the peoples of Israel once again know who they are. They no longer believe themselves to be Gentiles. Israelites understand that they are God's people, and this is cause for singing and gladness and giving praise. It will certainly be a miraculous occasion when the modern peoples of Israel realize who they are. The idea that the lost 10 tribes of Israel can be found in Western nations is highly unpopular today. Those in the West who have even heard of it put this notion somewhere between uneducated, wild-eyed fanaticism at best and racism at worst. This is assuredly not common knowledge today, and clearly the peoples of Israel do not want to believe the historical fact of their ancestry. As with the rest of God's truth that is rejected by carnal man, Israelites believe what they have been conditioned to believe and what they want to believe. An individual's belief in his physical descent from Israel is highly unpopular at least in part, because when he accepts it, he must also accept the requirements and obligations that come with it. How often do Protestant leaders, many of whom are Israelites, make statements such as, only the Jews have to keep the law, Christians are under grace. In these words, they misunderstand the intent of the law as well as the identity of God's physical people today. This penchant, even among the religious, is so set against the reality of where God's people are that it will take something extraordinary for the scales to be stripped from their eyes. Somehow, though, this knowledge will be restored to Israel, or at least to the remnant. We know from Israel's history that she does not like being called into account or told things that are inconvenient or that would cause her to have to change. This is why, more often than not, she killed the prophets, the messengers God sent to warn or to instruct. It usually took something calamitous, like captivity or subjugation, before the Israelites would relent and listen to God. Perhaps this is part of the reason Jacob's trouble 
will be so severe and why Yeshua describes it as a time of great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time. Israelites are a tough people to crack, especially as they have become more secular, and it will take a tremendous amount of distress for them to let go of their worldly predispositions and accept God's word. However, in Jeremiah, describing the second exodus shows that one way or another, this will take place. Israel again ransomed from the hand of someone stronger, just as in the original exodus. Similarly, Jeremiah foretells that God will break his yoke from Israel's neck and will burst your bonds Foreigners shall no more enslave them. Isaiah adds that such as have escaped of the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. The Israelites return with weeping and with pleas for mercy. The tribulation has humbled them, and now they can see both how they have fallen short and what is expected of them. They are broken through destruction, so at last, reconciliation with God can occur. They finally recognize that they need God, a concept totally foreign in the nations of Israel today. God will once again be their father, rather than being rejected and estranged as he is today. Ephraim will resume his place as God's son. Ephraim was the leading tribe in the north and thus often represents all of the northern ten tribes. Jeremiah describes this change of heart. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. You have chastised me, and I was chastised. Like an untrained bull, restore me, and I will return. For you are the Lord my God. Surely after my turning, I repented. And after I was instructed, I struck myself on the thigh. I was ashamed, yes, even humiliated, because I bore the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For though I spoke against him, I earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. Set up signposts, make landmarks, set your heart toward the highway, the way in which you went. Turn back, O virgin of Israel, turn back to these, your cities. Notice how different verses 18 and 19 sound from anything being spoken by the peoples of Israel today. After Jacob's trouble, Israel will actually grieve and moan due to the correction she receives. She will beg to be brought back to God. Verse 20 shows the unmistakable compassion and feeling that God has for his people and his determination to lift them out of the pitiful physical and spiritual condition they will be in at that point. Verse 21 tells of Israel reversing the course of her migration millennia ago. Set your heart toward the highway, the way in which you went. Turn back. Israel comes to this condition and pleads for God's restoration before she makes the second exodus. Just as Israel cried out in Egypt to the God of their fathers, and then God delivered them. If this is correct, the identity of Israel will be recognized sometime during Jacob's trouble, but before the second exodus takes place. If the patterns of Israel's history remain consistent, God will remind Israel of her obligation to him, which will include the knowledge of who Israel is. She will not listen. Israel has rarely listened. So God will cause the nations of Jacob to go through such trouble as they have never experienced. Though God does not revel in destruction, he knows best what it will take to turn his people around. In the end, the repentant people who remain will be willingly led back to the promised land. When God brings back repentant Israel, it will be rejoined with the remnant of Judah under the resurrected King David. Then say to them, thus says the Lord God, surely 
I will take the children of Israel from among the nations wherever they have gone and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell there, they, their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. The reconstituted nation of Israel, as well as the promised land, will undergo a tremendous restoration. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. The desert will bloom, the people's hearts will be strengthened, and the sick will be healed. The land will produce abundantly, the people will multiply, and the old cities will be rebuilt. God will deliver them from their uncleannesses, undo the land's desolation, and bless the fruit of the fields and the trees. Israel will be comforted, be given hope, and will finally call God my husband. Even more importantly, Israel will undergo a spiritual rejuvenation. Jeremiah provides an encouraging conclusion to the saga of Israel and Judah once they have repented and returned to the land. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. These verses from Hebrews shows that this is the same covenant that the church has already made with God. Rather than doing away with the law of God, the new covenant gives the people the means not to merely obey it, but to accept it and make it a part of their lives. God will give the people of Israel and Judah new hearts. They will finally be able to follow God consistently and have real relationships with Him. God will forgive their sins 
and Israel will finally begin to be the witness to the rest of the world that God intended her to be. Even though God makes this covenant primarily with Israel and Judah, it is not exclusive. Through Isaiah, God shows that Gentiles who submit themselves to him can and will also make this covenant. A particular interest is the requirement that the Sabbath be kept by those wishing to do this. Interestingly, despite God bringing the remnant of Israel out of the countries of their scattering and their being ashamed of their conduct, God will further sift his people to ensure that any rebels against him will not be allowed into the land. Apparently, some will return from captivity but be prohibited from entering the land due to their rebellion. Finally, in Ezekiel, it foretells of Israel and Judah receiving from God a new heart, a spiritual heart that will enable them to keep his commandments and statutes. Therefore, say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples, assemble you from the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts follow the desire for their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. Throughout its history, the essential difficulty in Israel's relationship with God was one of the heart. God exclaims, Oh, that Israel had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. In Hebrews, God again identifies this problem. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. The heart or spirit of a man is the center of his thought, reason, and motivation. Because of human nature, the natural unconverted heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. It has an innate powerful pull toward the self, always making evaluations based on what it perceives as good for the individual, regardless of the effect on others. Humanity has had approximately 6,000 years of such self-centered and destructive living, proving that man is simply unable to govern himself for very long. He needs direction and leadership from another divine source. The old covenant that God made with Israel was a good agreement as far as it went, because all of God's works are good. The problem was not with its terms, but with the people who made it. They lacked the right heart that would have allowed them to follow God truly and obey His laws. God, though, will give a new heart, a new spirit to repentant Israelites, along with any others who desire to covenant with Him. This new spirit is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. It is the same spirit that Yeshua told his disciples they would receive, the power that would allow them through their words and especially through the conduct of their lives to be witnesses of God. It is a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind, a mind that is balanced because God's concerns reside at its core. It is a mind inclined to obey God and to seek Him as the only source of true solutions in a world that doesn't have the means or inclination to live in a way that is good for everybody. As Israel becomes God's model nation due to her new heart and spirit, the rest of the world will see that God's way, including His commandments, statutes, and judgments, produce peace and abundance. It is the nature of God's laws that, because of their source, they bring good, prosperity, health and abundance, peace and contentment. Yet, it takes the same spirit as the lawgiver 
for one to understand and keep the laws in their true spiritual intent. Israel's godly example will be so striking that the rest of humanity will desire to live the same way and will seek not only God's laws, but God himself. Thus says the Lord of hosts, peoples shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us continue to go and pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will go also. Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man saying, let us go with you for we have heard that God is with you. This is also foretold in Ezekiel. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. God then will chastise, humble, restore, and bless Israel with a new spirit so that she can show the rest of the world how to live. Peter writes, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Throughout the many prophecies concerning Israel, the faithfulness of God is revealed at every turn. Because of God's faithfulness to his promises, he will act to overshadow the exodus from Egypt with a second exodus. Due to his faithfulness, the tides of history will again turn and he will redeem his people from the depths of desperation and raise them to new heights. The nations that oppress Jacob will themselves be plundered and enslaved. Because God is faithful to his purpose for Israel, she will be humbled and brought to repentance. He will not completely destroy her, but will do what is necessary to bring her to the spiritual condition and physical location that he planned from the beginning. Though his promises span thousands of years, God's faithful purpose will never fail. Well, that's our program for today. And I want you to know we appreciate your support. The time to take a stand is now. Be a leader in your community and in your church. One person can make a difference. Get involved with and support pro-Israel organizations such as PJTN. Visit our website to learn more. Sign up to receive action alerts and other films to share with family and friends. We'll see you next time on Focus on Israel. Thank you again for joining me on this edition of Proclaiming Justice. Please share this podcast with your family and friends. For more information about how you can get involved, please visit our website at pjtn.org. As a PJTN watchman, you can help us keep up the fight to preserve our freedom for our children and their children for such a time as this.